kind of finished insofar as it's working and it's doing all the things that I actually want it to do right now. But saying that, I don't think it will ever be finished because as I've made this modular, if a new product comes out or something that I built that I want to test, I can very simply remove whatever it is going to replace and test it. Later in another video, I'm going to make a recording going through this preamp and through the L12 amplifier that I've built previously and make a direct recording for me YouTube friendly but horrible music. And I'm going to do that by placing the um, recording on the speaker output of the amplifier so you will you will hear how it actually sounds with of course the reservations that YouTube are going to mess about with the sound and you're going to be listening to this on something which can be anything from a rather nasty phone to some decent hi-fi so please bear that in mind I'll, I'll tell you more about that later so for the moment let's go inside and have a look and see what I've done now there are a couple of things I need to point out before we start the potentiometer behind the volume control here is a temporary one because if you've tried to order anything from China of late you'll know that the delivery is horrendously long um, in some cases I've been waiting two and a half months the wiring inside around the volume pot is temporary so anything that looks neat is semi-permanent and anything that looks like a bird's nest is work in progress so bear that in mind please now this is an overview of the ingredients and if I zoom up slightly this is the valve bases and the whole thing just swivels out on this umbilical lead which again I have to change because it's a little bit too stiff and the effect of that is it doesn't go where I want it to when I shut the thing up so I'm going to remove the sleeving on here and just use the the wires um, tie wrapped together so it will be the same but it will be the wires rather than the sleeving because the sleeving is very stiff on this now one of the main things I've changed on this since we last spoke this module here was going to be and and was until about two weeks ago a Wi-Fi module no it wasn't <laughs> oh dear I'll delete this bit um, this module was previously going to be a Bluetooth module but one night I was thinking to myself why have I got a Bluetooth module in there because a I will I will never be connecting my telephone to this and I couldn't think of any reason why I would have a Bluetooth module in there it just doesn't make any sense to me because I wouldn't seriously dream of using music on a telephone to be played through my hi-fi so that's gone and in its place I've got the DAC which again we've talked about in previous um, episodes now I've connected this this is the optical input and there's a socket on there on the back and also along here I've connected the coaxial input to this particular phono and that's the input so I've got a choice of optical or coaxial input on the DAC and most of the time that's what I've been using and it does sound really good this is the high voltage booster for the HT for the magic eye and that is as it always was the only thing I've done is I've added a heat sink to it because that 
um, transistor, which is basically the oscillator. Well, actually, it's the, it's the sort of power amplifier of the oscillator, if that makes sense. Um, does get quite hot, and in my opinion, um, too hot, insofar as you can touch it, but you can't hold your finger on it for very long. And I, I firmly believe electronics that runs hot is going to be a problem in the future. So I put that heat sink on there, and the heat sink now when you touch it is nicely warm but it's really the biggest I could put there and it still sort of makes sense. I've retained the two transformers that I originally put in here. This one provides the um, 12 volts for the switchboard and also the high voltage booster and the actual drive circuitry for the magic eyes and it's kind of ironic that 50% or more of the circuitry in here is just to light the magic eyes and make them work which is kind of ironic really something else that I've added here is this little board here and that is purely to provide the plus and minus 15 volts that the new preamp board more about that in a minute, uses and requires. It gets its supply from this small transformer here, which is 15 naught 15. Now, the preamp itself uses a very, very low current. So this um, rectifier stroke regulator board doesn't even get warm. And it's there. It's there really because I need, obviously, DC um, semi stabilized, so you've got the obligatory bridge rectifier here. Bit of smoothing, the regulators for the plus and minus rails, a little bit more smoothing, and of course, I nearly forgot the magic LEDs. And it's also got small capacitors here, um, which are in parallel with the main regulators. Now, I'm embarrassed to show you this and to talk about this particular board. The board we're looking at is here, and that is the preamp. I know it's pitifully small, and it's a huge box with lots of electronics in it, but that is the best board I have found so far. And all, all these preamp boards which I've tried use is the 5532, um, which, um, as I've spoken mentioned before is a chip that I like very much. Now this area here is still temporary because if you can just about see it in there there's a very small potentiometer um, simply because I'm waiting for an Alps but I haven't got it yet so that's what I picked up from J car but surprisingly it's it's pretty good. I did some matching tests on it and it tracks within about one and a half dB throughout, which is really quite good for a logarithmic pot. Um, linear pots tend to track much better because the, the resistance, as the name suggests, is linear, a linear deposit all the way round the track. Whereas a logarithmic pot is basically three linear pots jammed together. Um, the, the, the deposit of carbon or whatever they're using is not literally logarithmic and so you get a small part linear and then a jump to another value and then another jump to another value so it's, it's really a very very rough simulation of logarithmic as you'd expect to find that curve and so the effect of that is the jumps going from one on a on a single mono pot or a single track pot it doesn't really matter but in a stereo pot where both tracks should track they often don't and when you'll find that the higher the value of resistance i.e. if you're using say a 1 meg which i doubt you would on transistorized circuitry because the impedance would be too high and uh, this particular pot is 50k. You could also use 100k 
Um, there's no great detriment, or well, there's, there's no detriment in sound or, or impedance issues, but you get a far better track on the linear, uh, uh, pardon me, the, the lower value tracks, i.e. 50k. You don't want to go much lower than that because you'll start to get impedance matching problems. So this little board, I featured on, I'll put a link in the description if you want to have a look at it, but it is just literally a DC coupled op amp. And it's the most neutral sounding, as you'd expect, because there's, there's no capacitors in the signal path and its frequency response is DC to 50k. Well, I stopped measuring at 50k because it was still flat. And um, after 50k, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't care. But it's not 1 dB down at that level. It's just still flat. So as far as it's going to have minimal tonal qualities on it. And as far as I can tell, I've tried this preamp in and out of circuit, just connecting straight to the main amplifier. And apart from the jump in gain, there is absolutely no difference in sound that I can perceive. And I've spent literally the last three weeks listening to this at every opportunity. And it goes down to the idea that the simpler the preamp, the better. And when I see preamps, and they've got hundreds of components in them, hundreds. And bearing in mind, I don't have a turntable, so I don't need any RIA correction or three millivolts input. I just need line input, basically. And as the main amplifier, um, you have to have the gain probably at about three o'clock to get reasonable listening level. Um, it needs a gain of a, between five and ten, and that's exactly what this little preamp does. Just a quick look at the back panel. It's pretty obvious what's what. There are actually four inputs available. One of them goes to the DAC, which is here, and that's the optical input. And the other DAC input is this single phono coaxial input. And the other two are linear inputs for from preamp. And these two here are the main, well, they're the only outputs. And that's where you put the go go juice. Now, ironically, an area that I've had the most problems with has got nothing to do with the sound. And that's what you're looking at now, which is the uh, magic or one of the magic eyes. When I first received these magic eyes, one of them was faulty insofar as the display, instead of doing this, which it should do, there was a weird, well, mess is all I can say down here. And um, initially I thought I'd made a mistake on the preamp board. So I swapped the valves over, which is luckily what you can do with stereo. And the fault obviously traveled to the other channel. So clearly I had a faulty valve. And I must say that the supplier of the Magic Eye project um, parts supplied me a replacement very quickly. And I thought at this stage it would be a good idea to get a couple more Magic Eyes in stock. So this is my stash of Magic Eyes. These are the two that came with one of the kits that I bought. This is the kit, although it's not actually a kit, it's um, um, already assembled. And you just break the board down the middle if you want to mount them separately. Now, the only problem with this board is it doesn't have any um, boost on it. You literally have to feed in 250 volts DC and obviously the 6.3 volts for the heaters. But the reason I've ended up with this is simply, I wanted two replacement valves, um, but it's cheaper to buy this kit with these boards than it is to buy the two valves separately, which 
uh, doesn't make any sense to me, but I thought, well, there's some useful components on there I might be able to salvage. Now, I hope I can hold this in focus. But look at this pot. It's never, ever been put into the PCB. There's no solder on it. And needless to say, it wouldn't work. Now, that hasn't bothered me particularly because I didn't want it to work. I just wanted the valve holders and the spare valves. But it, this is just another example of crap from China. It clearly can't have been tested and clearly hasn't been inspected. Also, when I got this kit, one of the valves had an internal short circuit on it. What happens is when you plug it in and the display opens up and it starts to work and all of a sudden there's a slight ting and the display shuts completely and it draws too much current and it drop, makes the HT drop to about 150 volts and makes the regulator really hot. And I can't show you on here because I've fixed it now, but inside where the wires come from the pins, they were just too close. And as the valve heated up, it sort of expanded and then touched and short circuited it. And eventually it welded itself together and the valve was useless. But I thought, I've heard that you can cure such faults by zapping it. And I thought, well, I'm on the grounds that the valve is deceased and no longer functioning, I'll have a go at this. So I've got big capacitor, charged it up with lots of volts and connected it to the relevant pins. I can't remember which ones now because this was about a month ago. And I just zapped it and it flashed over inside. First time it didn't work. And I thought, ah, more volts. So <laughs> I put on about 300 volts DC and charged up this capacitor and zapped it again. And lo and behold, it's now perfectly functioning. And uh, I'm really ultra pleased with myself because I've never ever done anything like that. But anyway, that's another story. The main thing about these valves are they're made in China. Surprise, surprise. And the quality control and, and the construction of them internally is appalling. Um, of the five that I've now got, none of them look the same on the display. The two that I'm actually using on the main amplifier now are the nearest. But where the um, um, fluorescent paint is put on there, the electronics behind it don't always line up. Sometimes they're too far down. Um, and the characteristics of them are, are way, way different. When you set them up, the actual gain of them, and because there's a, a triode preamp inside it, is, is, is varies by about 15%, which to me is absolutely appalling. Um, and the actual look of the display varies tremendously. You can see this one here. The phosphor goes well into the black area of, of the valve, as opposed to this one, where it clearly goes right the way round, and the black area is behind it. So that means on this one, you get a shadow. I should take it out of the bag, really, shouldn't I? Anyway, well, you can see that quite clearly, I'm sure. The black area means the display is dark there. So if you're going to buy it into these things, you need to get double the quantity of valves unless you are very lucky. And it just makes me wonder what some of their audio valves are like. And I certainly wouldn't risk, if I was building a hi-fi valve amplifier, I certainly wouldn't use valves from China. Now this is the original preamp board that I installed originally. It had a potentiometer on here, which I'd removed because the matching on it was absolutely atrocious. It was about nearly 5 dB out on one of the steps. So that's gone into the dustbin. 
And I can't really say why I don't like this, but it, it doesn't have a very neutral sound. I don't know why it doesn't. I think it's possibly because one chip is used as a buffer and I don't really know why you need a unity gain buffer because all that can do is add noise. So that's gone. I've shown you this one and I've decided not to use that because it uses too low a voltage. Now there's nothing wrong with that for small signal amplitude but it runs out of volts very easily. These preamps are excellent when they're run on plus and minus 15 volts. This only has, I can't remember now, I think about seven or eight volts per side and it's single ended. Um, I don't know. The things that I like about op, certain op amps is these in particular. They operate on a high internal voltage, well high for 30 volts plus or minus 15. That means under normal circumstances you will never get anywhere near clipping. Never. You simply don't, whatever you put in here it will quite happily accept 30 or 40 millivolts um, and it's quite capable of producing six or seven volts easily. So perfect, but this module no good. Well to sum up this I'm sure you'll see this preamp again with something different inside it because that's just the way it is. I, f I experiment with these different modules and things and it's amazing how the same chip used on different boards sounds differently. I've even tried messing about with other chips. There's the OP range and there's the LM range and to be perfectly honest with you I can't hear any difference. I've tried uh, measuring frequency response and, thing, and they're all virtually identical. The only thing I did find is the LM series, um, which you can use in these as a direct replacement, was a little bit more noisy. And the OP range, um, I don't know, I think anybody would be very happy with any of those chips. But I still kept coming back to the 5.5, which I still like, and I've tried half a dozen different samples on there, and they all sound pretty well. Noise levels of all these things are within a couple of dB, and, and, and when the signal-to-noise ratio is getting on for minus 90 to 100 dB, 2 dB is not, is, is not even worth talking about. Well, in the next day or so, make that video I've promised of sound going into this, into the DAC input, coming out of the preamp and going into the power amplifier and I should take the signal from the speaker terminals. Now the only thing I need to make you aware of is um, I can't feed the output of the amplifier directly into the camera. Um, I've tried that and it just overloads the input and it, as, gets, as it's designed for an extension microphone. So I will record that um, on the computer and try and sync up the display um, to the sound. But more of that on the next video.